Matthew chapter 9, we will be looking at verses 18 through 26. Uh, We'll tell two stories of two women, uh, which are pretty profound as we read them in scriptures here. Uh, The purpose of Jesus' healings was to bring an awareness to his authority, to his lordship, but also to his deity. Have you ever asked yourself, why don't we see more healings today? Why don't we see healings like in the book of Acts? Why don't we see healings like Jesus did when he walked among us? Why is it that he doesn't heal me? Or he doesn't heal my brother or sister who are in chronic pain or who is dying of cancer? Why doesn't he heal us? Why doesn't he heal like he used to heal? Well, again, the purpose of Jesus' healing was to bring awareness to his authority, lordship, and deity. To his authority. Jesus healed constantly wherever he went, whoever came to him, because he wanted to let the world know, and even in our day, that he has the authority. He is the only one that has that kind of authority. He wanted to let people know that he was Lord of all things, even Lord over disease and nature itself, and even death, which we'll see today. No one else is Lord over all things. And by the way, as Lord, we need to submit ourselves to him as Lord. We call him Lord. We sing songs that he is our Lord. That means that he is our master, And as our master, we are to be obedient to him. And he gave us the evidence that he is our master by the healings that he performed. But not only that, he is deity. He is God in the flesh because at any moment, at any time, he would heal. At his will, he would touch. In fact, I don't believe, and correct me if I'm wrong there after the service, not during that Jesus did not heal someone when they asked. I don't know of a place where Jesus didn't heal him. And so as deity, his desire was to show that he is God in the flesh. Well then, why didn't the apostles do as much? Because they didn't need the authority, nor were they lords, nor were they deity. But healings did and were performed during their time. But as you read the book of Acts, you'll notice that healings began to diminish and so we come today and we ask god why aren't you healing us we know you can heal but you don't heal us because we are not trying to prove anything as to god's authority his lordship or deity we are trying to now live and reflect the light of christ in whatever situation that we're in so we need to have a balance and this message today is not literally on healing in our faith though it talks about those things but this message is, ab- is really about his authority, and so I, I themed it the king's authority. Because ultimately, ultimately, it's not about this world and what we endure in this world, what we enjoy in this world, whatever materialistic uh, desires you may have for this world. Ultimately, it's what? It's in the world to come. Uh, we are only promised 70 to 80 years, and that's it. And after that, eternity. So... How we live now within our sicknesses and illnesses is how we reflect Christ in our lives. So verses 18 through 26 continue with that theme of authority. And Jesus demonstrates his authority over death as well as healing. Death itself. No one else has that authority to raise someone up from the dead. So Christ restores a dead girl and heals a woman who is dealing with an issue of blood for 12 long years years let's read the text and then i want to point out a couple of things and we'll get into it verse 18 while he spoke these things to them behold a ruler came and worshiped him saying my daughter has just died but come and lay your hand on her and she shall live so jesus arose followed him and so did his disciples and suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years, came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, 
If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, Make room, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when the crowd was put out, he went in, took her by the hand, and the girl rose. And the report of this went into all that land. I've highlighted a few areas here. I think the, the key here, again, is, is the king's authority. That Jesus has authority. He has the choice to follow this ruler, this leader, who is a part of a synagogue, who people know, who is religious, who decides and chooses to come and worship at the feet of Jesus because he knows that Jesus has the authority and power to heal. And so his faith in Christ's authority and power was very strong. Jesus had the will to follow and to help or to choose not to. And in this case, he chose to go and help this man because his daughter was already dead. Now, his faith was great because his daughter was dead, dead. She was no longer alive. She's laying at home on a bed, expired, as some police officers might say. I, I remember when my, my father had passed away, he had tried to drive himself to a hospital, and as he got into the parking lot, he just expired at that moment. The car was on and everything. Police had to, to break in and, and turn the car off. And uh, they gave my sister a call. I guess he had her number in his wallet somewhere. And the police officer said, your father has expired. And my sister's reaction right away was, is he a piece of meat that he's expired a date or something? And she just got so emotional. But they used the word expired, dead, gone. Um, you might read this story because Jesus uh, does say that the girl is asleep, right? And some might read that and say, ah, she really wasn't dead. And we have cases today where, where people have been dead for several minutes and then we bring them back alive. And if you're in the medical field, you probably have read some of those cases and maybe even experienced those things. And we bring them back alive. And so many skeptics will say, oh, she wasn't really dead. She, she was in that place in that state where everything was shutting down and they thought she was dead. They weren't you know, technically aware of all that's going on in her body and so forth. But the Bible says she was dead. In fact, she just died. She just died right now. And so out of desperation, out of love, out of faith, hearing what Jesus has done, the miracles that he performed, being a man, a religious man who understands authority like the centurion soldier who came to Jesus. You remember that story we read earlier and said, I understand authority. And if you just speak it, I know it will be done because I too am a man with authority. And this religious leader understands that same authority. And if he understands, as the scriptures say, that, that how can a man do these miracles unless he is of God? You know, of course, they begin to blame um, Satan for the work in Jesus' life to discredit him. But this religious leader was honest with himself and the situation. He knew his daughter was dead. And he knew that Jesus was healing. And who can heal but God? And so let's go. And talk to Jesus. So he goes to Jesus, it says there. Uh, and he tells him, my daughter just died. And if you just come, and if you just put your hand on her, I know that she'll live. Wow, that's, that's some faith. That's faith in action, in a sense. That's a faith that, that, that deeply understands that Jesus has all authority and power to heal and to take care of things. And so Jesus immediately, he, he could have stopped and said, well, what do you mean she's, she's dead? Let's talk about this a little bit, you know? He didn't say anything. He says, let's go. And his disciples followed along with him. And so as he's going and as he's walking, 
And as he's preparing to heal this young girl, a woman, it says a woman. And now this woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. She comes along, and I highlighted it, came from behind him. Why did she come from behind him and touch the hem of his garment? This woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. You can only imagine what she was going through. You can only imagine the, the process every day of just cleaning, every day of preparing to go out, let alone the fact that she was possibly unclean because the Levitical law talked about an issue of blood, a menstrual cycle, and that it continued on. And so she was literally unclean. She couldn't go to worship service. She couldn't uh, fellowship with other believers in the Jewish faith. She couldn't come around the crowds. She was literally unclean. So she isolated herself from the rest of society. And so she walked kind of on the fringes of life with this issue of blood. She had, the other, other writers tell us that um, she tried physicians. She tried all kinds of other means to take care of this. And nothing helped her at all. Can you imagine her emotional state at this moment? You can almost see <clears throat> how she deals with life because of this. You know, it's interesting how we deal with life because of our past, because of our struggles and our hurts. A lot of things goes, goes on in our, our lives. And, and those things have made us into who we are today. <clears throat> you know, they say that um, people who, and these are the, the scientists and the doctors and people that have done a lot of work and research <clears throat> on this whole tendency of same-sex relationships, but they say that the majority of them have been abused when they were younger by the opposite sex. And that's why they had this tendency to be drawn to the same sex, because the opposite sex has hurt me. They did things to me. And that stuff can linger on for a long time. It can cause people to look for that mentality of, of love and acceptance, you know, but not from them because them hurt me. You remember the movie, The Neighborhood, right? And, and it seemed like those three, at least three or four of those men were abused. And, and I thought it was interesting how they each handled it differently. Now, one of them was, oh, yeah, okay, try it one more time and I will kill you. You know, they took it like, I'm a man. I'm not a girl, and I will kill you if you do this again. And so they led a life of destruction and, and, and anger and, and hurting people because of that, uh, where others dealt with it differently, and we all deal with it differently. Uh, some, uh, from what I understand too, women, because they've been abused, will then live a life uh, looking for that love and the feeling that they're worthless, they're no good, so I might as well just kind of lay with whoever, whenever. And then they become that person that everyone knows is just, you know, um, lasciviousness, just lives that life that way. And they don't want to. In reality, they really don't. I don't think anyone does. I think they're like this woman where they're living on the fringe of life and they're hurting and there's a lot of pain inside. And they need to really... They need to come to Jesus. They need to come. And, and you see the attitude where she comes from behind. I don't want to get in anyone's way. I don't want to be a nuisance. I don't want to all of a sudden, you know, disturb. I just come behind. And if I can just touch the hem of his garment, just the tassels, then I know, she said, I'll be made well. She too knew that Jesus had the authority. She had great great faith in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so she comes from behind and she touches the garment and she's made well. Now it's interesting though that she thought it was the garment. She thought it was the garment. If I can just touch the garment, the, the tassels, and the Jews were required in Leviticus to, to sew tassels on their garments. And it was a sign. In fact, they had a whole procedure in, in making the knots of tassels in such a way that it actually made a Hebrew uh, letter which says Jehovah is one. And so they, they wore this all the time, the males. And if you were a religious leader, Pharisee, Sadducees, you'd make your tassels a little bit bigger, you know, because you're religious. 
you know, and you want to let people know Jehovah's one, you know, type of thing. It's interesting. I don't, I don't, you know, disagree with wearing Christian shirts. You know, God is one. I used to wear one. Jesus is God, you know, and I wore that thing out. Uh, I don't mind doing that, but, you know, if you're throwing that out there, you know, and you're saying Jesus is God and, you know, and and then not of this world, you know, not N, you know, O, T, W, not of this world. I see that all over the place, you know, and of course they're going 100 miles an hour and they're throwing litter out their window and, you know, they're doing all this stuff and angry and, you know, and so forth. That's why I don't put any of that stuff on my car because <laughs> I know I speed. I know I get frustrated when I'm driving. I know that I'm trying to get somewhere and I can't get there fast enough, so I'm like, I'm pick that stuff off. <laughs> the religious leaders put that stuff on there so that people can look at them. A- and we as Christians sometimes can want to be looked at as holy. You know, we want to have some sort of piety, you know. I'm a Christian, and I'm better than you. Not that we say that, but sometimes our attitude reflects that. When in reality, we are, we are really to be humbled uh, people. Um, as Jesus said, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, then be the servant of all. To be a servant is much more better to, than to be lifted up and one with authority. He, you have Jesus who definitely had the authority, the lordship, and the deity, and yet he washed the feet of the disciples. He was that example. He did not come to to be served, but to serve and also to give his life as a ransom so that we could have eternal life, eternal life. And, and she thought, if I just touch the tassels, I'll be made well. And, and she does, and she is healed completely, and Jesus recognized that some of the other writers talk about a, a, he felt power go out from him. And you knew this. But that's wrong doctrine. Her doctrine was wrong. It wasn't the tassels. It wasn't the garment. It was Jesus that healed her. And it was only Jesus. Well, then why did God heal her if she had a wrong doctrine? Because God is gracious and merciful. You can have the wrong doctrine. You can have the right, wrong concept of who God is. And God is so gracious enough to heal you, to have mercy and grace on you, hoping, I think, because I think Scripture is clear, is that He desires that we get to know Him. And then as we get to know Him, then our doctrine becomes right. You will see that oftentimes, at least in the past. I don't watch TBN too often anymore. I just... You just get frustrated with it sometimes when you have some of these faith healers uh, on there. Um, I remember um, Benny Hinn, someone just posted this, just reminded me, and I used to watch him once in a while, and he'd go around and, and talk about the anointing of the Holy Spirit in his life. And he would come up to someone and just barely go like that, and they'd fall down. And they called it back then the slain in the Spirit. The Spirit is moving. Well, then all of a sudden, he had a coat, and he'd take his coat off, and he'd start wailing it. And guys would start walking at him, and he'd wail it like this, and boom, they'd fall down, fall down, and just keep coming at him. He just, whoo, 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 his cloth was just knocking them all down. Then he'd go to the crowd, and whoo, whoo, boom, and the whole crowd would just fall down. That's anointing of the Holy Spirit. You don't find that anywhere in Scripture. You, you see it here, and they pull this out of context, and they um, begin to tell you that God does this all the time when you don't see it in scripture anywhere at all the slain in the spirit of god no it was jesus that healed her it was jesus who gave her the touch and he says to her you know he says to her that she had great faith you know be of good cheer he says to her be of good cheer your faith has made you well, your faith. <clears throat> was it her faith in Jesus Christ? Jesus says that it was her faith because she was made well from that hour. So the issue of blood had stopped. It was gone. It was no more. And she was healed. <clears throat> At that point then, we see that Jesus then begins to go with the man to the young girl. 
And so he goes up into the upper room there, and he finds that the girl is dead. Now, they had flute players there, they had mourners there, and it was their custom to hire them. In fact, there's a, the Mishnah says that, that if you were poor, you had to at least have a couple of flute players and a mourner there. If you were well off, like this rich uh, ruler was, then he probably had a whole orchestra of people there. And what you do is you go and you hire them, you go and you hire them to, to come to uh, your home, and they wail for you in sadness. They play the flutes, they play instruments, and they, in a sense, mourn the death of your loved one that has just passed away. And Jesus finds them all there, and he's kind of working his way through the crowd. And as he's working his way through the crowd, I, I highlighted it there, he says, make room, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And I'm like, okay. The, the Greek there says when the crowd outside uh, uh, reviled him, literally means they laughed him down. So they were laughing at him, and they were like laughing him down. You ever do that with someone when you cut them down? You know, they might be saying something or something happens, and all of a sudden you start laughing them down. You're cutting them down, and you make them, what, feel like this small? And so oftentimes we don't say anything anymore because we like, don't like to feel this small at all. And that's what they were trying to, to do with Jesus. You're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. She's dead. She's been dead. We've been here for a while. We've been playing the flutes. We've been mourning and screaming and yelling and you come in and you tell us that she's asleep and that was a jewish way uh, uh, for matthew to say that that i'm going to resurrect her i'm going to resurrect her from the dead in fact it's the same word there when she arose that is used of jesus's resurrection there and so Jesus says, get out of the way, move. In fact, he said, and in the Greek says that he told them to get out. And it was a forceful get out. In other words, remove them all from this place. Now, I found that kind of interesting because you would think that Jesus would want them there so that he can show them his authority over death. At least show the evidence and, and watch what I can do here. Now, they're going to see it after but they don't get to see it right there. Who gets to see it? The disciples get to go with Jesus. Now, those that have committed themselves to Jesus, surrendered their lives to Jesus, and, and want to see what Jesus is going to do. And, and God is preparing them for the future and what they're going to do when they finally get out there and do it. And so he goes into the upper room, and he immediately takes her by the hand, and she just wakes up. That's some power. That's some authority over death itself. Now, she woke up. I think one of the other Gospels says they gave her some, something to eat and some water. It doesn't say what happened to her while she was asleep. Did she go to heaven? You know, was she in Abraham's bosom? Uh, was she in a holding place? It doesn't say. So we really don't know. All we know is that she was dead, and Jesus touched her, and she arose. She arose. Now, she did not arise in a new body, though right? It was still the old body. It wasn't the resurrection like Jesus Christ, where Jesus resurrected with a new body, and he's walking down the road, and he's talking with men, and said, don't touch me yet, because I haven't totally rejuvenated, in a sense, my new body still isn't here yet. You know, this woman rose in the old body, which is sad, because she's still got to die somewhere down the road. But the fact that he has authority to resurrect her from the dead, that's power. And all because of the faith of the man in Jesus Christ. And Jesus saw that faith, and so he exercised his authority because the man exercised his faith in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus made her well. Notice that the people, the crowds outside, <clears throat> began to hear the report of what had happened. And they began to spread it all over the world there is evangelism right there because of the work of jesus in someone's life so if we come to jesus and we give him 
our life, we surrender our life to him, what does that mean? What, what does it mean to come to Jesus and surrender your life to him? Does it mean you come up to the front, maybe at a harvest crusade, and you say, Lord, come into my life. I accept you as my Lord and Savior, you know, in Jesus' name. And I, am I now saved at that moment? Or, or does it mean that, that God has been working in our lives maybe throughout the years and months, some situations taking place in your life, things that have happened that have been horrendous maybe, if not, so, some just good things may have happened, and all of a sudden you're realizing, is there really a God? And God is starting to work in your life, and I want to know, I want to find out, I want to I, I, I see if this Jesus is real. Is that at the moment that you're saved? When, when is it that you're saved? I don't know if we really know. But I know the evidence of our salvation is that there's fruit of our salvation, right? I mean, that is definitely clear. Anyone can say, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, that's, that's wonderful. Well, I've surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. Okay, that's wonderful. I know plenty of people who go to this church over here in sandals, and they have social lives, and they go out and party and drink at bars and things like that. Does that mean that they're saved? I don't know. The evidence doesn't seem to point that way. They call themselves Christians. They're a church, but they're not teaching through the Bible. They're teaching topicals. They're teaching messages that, that scratch the itchy ears of people in this culture. But it's messages like this that get down to the root of the Word of God and clearly explains it that challenges true believers. Because a true believer says, you know, Lord, I surrender, but now what do I do at this point? Where do I go with that? And I think that's what happened here. This woman, the crowd, the disciples, the ruler, do you think they all just shut their mouths? No, they begin to share with everyone else, evangelism. Uh, that, that's what I call kind of like a personal explosion of evangelism in their lives. They begin to share what happened in their life about Jesus and, and their situation. And they were sharing with whoever, whenever they possibly could. And, and that's what happens, the fruit of the Spirit in your life. When you accept Christ truly from your heart with the right motives, and they have to be the right motives, and, and well, what motives is that? Well, a motive of humility uh, first, you have to recognize that you have a need. This ruler had a need. His daughter was dead. This woman had a need. She had an issue of blood. So you have a need. We all have a need, whatever that need is. And we want God to meet that need. Secondly, humility. Humility in that we come to Jesus knowing that he's the only one that can help us. Buddha can't help us. He's dead in the grave. Muhammad can't help us. He's dead in the grave. Jesus is the only one that was put in the grave and resurrected from the grave, and you can't find him in the grave. He's resurrected. The only religious faith that, that shows that Jesus is alive, that he's been resurrected from the dead. And so when you truly humble yourself, now this humility is not necessarily based upon the fact that God will help you in your present situation. As I spoke earlier, Jesus is revealing his authority, his lordship, and his deity to the world. Today, he's not doing that. He's revealing himself through us. It is our responsibility to go out and let people know Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to the Father except through him. Now, you'll get laughed at, even by believers. Say, how can God really be so inclusive? No, there's just no way. By believers themselves, Allah's got to be God. And you have a lot of Christians saying Allah is God now. I don't believe that they're Christians. It's up to us to let people know. No, no, let's define who Jesus is. Let, let's define that. And you literally have to define that today in our society. You have to let them know he's the son of God, but he's also God in the flesh. He's not just the son of God. He's God. He was born by God through the Holy Spirit to a virgin. And you define that. And he's Lord. That means there's no other Lord around. That means that when you ask Christ and you humble yourself before him because you know he's the only way, the truth, and the life, and there's no way to what? The Father, but through him. So that eternal security, that really is the foundation of our faith and our walk with Christ is that we have eternal security and that we're going to heaven. Even if God doesn't heal us here and we have to go through misery and pain and suffering, we know that there... 
will be healed completely. That's the real motive of salvation when we humble ourselves. So we humble ourselves and we recognize that Jesus is the only one that can help us. And then we say, Lord, you're our Lord. You're our Lord. That means you're my master. So as a believer and as I surrendered myself to you, I don't want to be like the demons that James talks about. You know, they know Jesus, yet they fear and they tremble, right? They fear and they tremble because no, they know that Jesus will destroy them because they're not going to humble themselves before Jesus. And we see an example of that when we saw the demons in those two men that Jesus cast out. And they're like, can you cast us into the swines? We're not ready to go to eternal damnation yet. We want to still kind of hover around a little bit. So cast us into the swines. They feared him. They knew him. And they knew his authority and lordship because even they trembled. So we need to recognize his lordship. He is Lord. He is Lord of your life. He is Lord of my life. And believers walk around as though they are Lord and not Jesus. That is a different Jesus. We should be willing to submit to Jesus in all areas of life. Not just some. All areas of life. That's where the battle begins of sanctification in our life. When we struggle with the flesh and with the spirit. The spirit is always so willing, right? It's the, whole, the spirit of God that dwells in it. They, it wants to do the right thing. You know, and sometimes I'd look at Virginia and i tell her, I'm sorry, I'm like that. I don't know why. I, I just can't change that. I, I, I need to change it. Keep praying for me and I pray for it. And Lord, sometimes I cry. Lord, help me to change that. But man, it just it's just part of me it's like an arm and you just can't get rid of it you can just cast it off you know it'd be wonderful but you can't and that's the battle of, of submitting ourselves to his lordship jesus is lord he is master and, and so as james puts it don't just be hearers of the word but be ye doers of the word also right so we're to be doing the word of god and so when god reveals to us something in our lives then we should say okay lord help me to get rid of that, whatever that might be. Help me, and it might, need, might not even be getting rid of something, it's adding something. Help me to do that. I know sometimes we struggle with loving people, right? I don't know if you struggle with loving people, but I sure struggle with loving people. Uh, I can love a lot, but when you get pushed a lot, sometimes it's harder to love that, that person. And, and when you hear Jesus say, Love your enemies. You're like, oh, Lord, why did you have to write that one down? <laughs> you know, oh, well, why couldn't you say get back at your enemies or separate from your enemies? That, that's a tough one to deal with, and, and you have to humble yourself. And, and that may take a while. It may take the Lord working in your lives for years before you finally can just submit and allow him to live through you. It, it really does mean that that he has to live through you you have to move out of the way and let him live through you no matter how your feelings are so it's a matter of uh, of maybe putting on something and, and maybe taking off something whatever it is but we humble ourselves before him because he is lord he is our master and a good christian and a christian that loves god as john tells us if you love me you keep my commandments that's a measuring tool for us to know that we love him you ever ask yourself, we, we see here that the woman was what? She was talking to herself, right? You ever talk to yourself? I asked Gabby, uh, we were, we were uh, laying down, she was doing something and I was studying and, and all of a sudden I said, do I talk to myself? And she was, yeah. <laughs> like, how do you know? She goes, I see you. I'm like, huh, so I talk to myself, huh? I go, do I answer myself? She goes, yeah, <laughs> you answer yourself too. <laughs> I'm like, Really? You ever do that? Y'all know if you notice that or not. You ever talk to yourself? You know, you might be going down the street. What's that guy doing? Why is he doing that? I don't know why he's doing that. I mean, she's been doing that. I do that all the time. I even do that with the scriptures. You know, it's like, I don't understand that, Lord. Why did you, I don't, I don't get this. How come I'm struggling? Oh, Lord, help me with that. I'm like, oh, maybe if I did this. And then, oh, yeah, that's the answer. And you're like talking to yourself. I think that's why they said, Paul, you're beside yourself. You know, and you're going crazy. And she's talking to herself. And we do that when, with the Lord. And he's our Lord. And so we're like, Lord, okay, so I'm supposed to submit myself. Okay, I have to examine myself. I have to look at myself. Where am I really at? And it's self-examination, right? 
self-examination, self-confrontation. And we really should have that in our life as believers. We should look at ourselves first before we look at anyone else. We should ask ourselves, am I this way, Lord? Why am I that way? Help me not to be that way. Let me recognize these things. You might even want to journal it and say, here's, here's Reuben, his personality. Here's some of his flaws, you know, that type of thing. Don't let it boggle you down. Don't let it keep you from, from serving. Recognize them, give them to the Lord, and then start putting on Christ. As Colossians says, put him on and take off the flesh. And so you put Christ on and you live, allow him to live through you as he's working in your life. And so he's Lord. He's Lord. And when you recognize he's Lord and he says, now share, be a light, be salt to the world, then go out, go out. And that's what they were doing. This man went out and he was sharing. The, the young girl, I'm sure, was, was bouncing up and down and people that were the mourners and the flute players were going, whoa, and they were no longer derailing Jesus. They were now worshiping Jesus. And the crowds were growing as the report went throughout the land, it said. Because Jesus is God. And as God, he has every right to be sovereign, doesn't he? The word sovereign means that he and his plans will always come to futation. They're going to happen. He knows what he needs to do. He knows what's good in our lives. Whether we like it or not, his will will be done. He's sovereign. He's God. And we have to recognize that as God. I don't know what your God looks like, but your God should look like that. One with authority, one who's Lord over your life, and one who is sovereign. He's deity in your life. And that God is the God that you should be sharing with everyone else. Did they have faith? Of course they did. And they had faith in who? In Jesus Christ. And that's the first thing that every one of us should believe, that it's Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other way through the Father except through Him. We need to understand that we can go through Him, cast all our cares before Him, as Peter says, because He cares for us, and then believe and have faith that He can heal us. But if He doesn't, it's not His will, then we will still glorify Him. I don't know how many times in, in all my years I he I've heard people say, I've prayed to God and he doesn't hear me because he hasn't healed me yet. And so I don't believe in God and I won't go to church because of that. They have the wrong God because that's not the God. God is not a genie in a bottle that we conjure up and just say, okay, Lord, do what I say. Can you imagine, just think about it for a second. Can you imagine if Jesus did heal everybody? We'd be in the Garden of Eden again. Because every time you got a little headache, Jesus, oh, my head, please heal me. Oh, thank you, Lord. Right? I mean, where is, where is the suffering? Where is the appreciation? Where is where's the honor, the respect? Because now you're walking around, oh, Lord, heal it. Oh, all right. Thank you. Oh, Lord, oh, thank you, thank you. And eventually, you're just walking around totally healed, no pain, no suffering. There's no need for God. The pain and the suffering that, that we go through the chronic illness draws us to God, gives us a focus point that we keep focused on at all times. And so we need the pain, we need the suffering, we need the persecution so that our eyes and our hearts are always focusing on Jesus. Heal me, Lord, not now. Okay, when? Maybe tomorrow? Okay, I'll, I'll seek you today. I'll read your word. I'll, I'll trust in you. I'll pray. If not tomorrow, then the next day. If not the next day, then 10 years from now. If not 10 years from now, then when I finally get to heaven. When I finally get to heaven. But it keeps you focused. And that's where Jesus wants you, right by his side. You remember when he started healing the crowds and feeding them and taking care of their needs? And he said, let's get away from them. Because Jesus knew the heart of man. They were there for what? The food. They were there for the food and, and not for Jesus. It's wonderful to feed the homeless and have a heart for the homeless. <clears throat> but there's a point where they're just there taking advantage and they're really not seeking Jesus. And you have to make it very clear to them that they need to seek Jesus. Now, I did that. I've, you might say that I'm a little mean or cruel, but there was a person here that been here for quite a while and and they were just here whenever there was food 
They were just here when they were there, hand downs. And I finally just kind of challenged them. I said, hey, I heard that you go to another church too. He goes, oh, yeah, I do. I'm like, and then you come here, but I notice that you never come here to hear God's word. You'll sit down and then you'll just take off. But you're here when there's food. You're here when there's things to give out. I said, can I ask you a question? Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you love him? Yeah, I do. I'm like, then make a choice where you're going to be. And then choose to be there. I mean, those things will still be there, but choose to be at that church. And the first thing they said was, oh, you don't want me here. That's what it is, huh? You just don't want me here. You hate me, don't you? I'm like, wow. No, I actually love you. I'm trying to get you to draw closer to Christ and not to food and not to handouts. Come to Christ. Get to know him. Have a personal relationship with, oh, you know, you hate me. I'm out of here. I don't like this church. This church doesn't know God. And they take off. That's the evidence that they really don't know God. Because anyone that knows God knows that our focus should be God and not food and not what we can get. But people, God's a genie in the bottle. Let's rub it. What can I get from him? No, no. We need to evangelize, but we need to evangelize in what he has done for us in our lives. And one of the greatest things that he has done for me, and I've seen healings in my life. I've seen healings in my children. I've seen healings in the church. I've seen financial um, situations turn around completely, personally, and in other words. I've seen, I've seen a lot of those things, but that's not what keeps me with Jesus. You know what keeps me with Jesus? It's like uh, William Booth said, uh, he's the founder of the Salvation Army. You know, he said, if God would just take every man in person, just tie their arm you know, or their body on a, a rope and a string and just let them hang over hell for just a few minutes, he goes, then pull them back out. He goes, you'd have different people. That's what keeps me, the Lord, because I don't want to go to hell. I want eternal life, and he's the only one that has it. And John tells us in John 15, abide in me, and I will abide in you. And so as long as I'm abiding in him, following him, going to church, getting involved, serving, then I'm doing good. I'm abiding in him. It's those of you that I pray about. And at times, I'm worried, like Moses coming down from the mountain, is that you're not doing anything. You're not abiding. You show up once in a while. Those are the ones that I, I pray about. Those are the ones that concern me. Because they're not having the heartfelt relationship with Jesus Christ. And I wish that God would change that in your life.